Dash cam video of a teen jumping out of a moving car as he was being chased by police. We've got it coming up. Plus, former Marine Trevor Reed back in the U.S. after being released from a Russian prison. And that's a stopover at Joint Base San Antonio Lackland last night in the middle of the night. And after much needed rainfall this week in some spots, Justin Horn has a look at the latest drought monitor. Live from Case at 12. Good morning, San Antonio starts right now. And a good morning to you. The week is flying by. It is Thursday, April 28th. Yeah, it has flown by. Maybe mm -hmm. the rain helped. <laughs> Maybe it did. Hope you had a great week so far, and we're going to check in with Justin in just a minute. But for now, let's look at today's 9 at 9. We are still waiting to learn the names of two people killed in a shooting last night on Fredericksburg Road, not far from Oak Hills Country Club. According to police, a man and two women were sitting in a car when someone came up to the vehicle and started shooting. As of this morning, police were still searching for the suspect. Former Marine and Texas resident Trevor Reed making his way back home after landing at Joint Base San Antonio Lackland overnight. His parents also with him at Lackland. Reed's release was half of an unexpected prisoner swap that came despite high tensions between the U.S. and Russia. European leaders blasted Russia's decision to cut natural gas shipments to Poland and Bulgaria as blackmail. They said the cutoff and Russia's warning that it might cut shipments to other countries is a failed attempt to divide the West over its support for Ukraine. Russia's decision to use its most essential export as leverage marked a dramatic escalation in the economic war of sanctions and counter sanctions that has unfolded in parallel to the fighting on the battlefield. Rudy Giuliani is expected to appear before the January 6th House Select Committee next month. He was a key figure in former President Trump's bid to overturn the 2020 election. In his case, there are issues of attorney-client privilege as well as executive privilege tied to the office of the ex-president. Still struggling to find enough computer chips to make cars and trucks, Ford reported it lost just over $3 billion in the first quarter. Also eating into its profits is Ford's investment in an electric vehicle startup. Another back and forth day for markets ending with stocks right about where they were to start. The S&P ended up gaining 0.2% after a midday rally faded out. Same thing for the Dow. NASDAQ closed yesterday, trading down a fraction. Shares of Facebook's parent Meta jumping after it posted first quarter profits and subscriber growth that both beat expectations. Profits came in at just under seven and a half billion, which is down more than 20% compared to a year ago. But active users were up in March to just under two billion a day. PayPal has been one of the worst performing stocks on the S&P 500 this year. Shares of the digital payments giant have plunged more than 55% so far in 2022. That's despite the popularity of Venmo, which PayPal owns. The chief financial officer blames inflationary pressures, supply chain issues, and the lack of any new stimulus from the federal government. Sin City wrapping up the final preparations for the NFL Draft tonight. The first round kicks off at 7 p.m. and you can watch it live right here on KSAT 12. David Sears will have a breakdown of what to expect during this year's draft later in the show. And that's today's 9 at 9. Let's go outside with live cam. We've been hovering around 70 degrees out at San Antonio International all morning long. And there's a live look at the airport, the control tower on the right side of your screen. Lots of clouds out there, Justin. Yeah, mostly cloudy, although you can see just a little bit of blue if you look up there at the top of your screen. I, I think clouds will eventually go away today. We'll see some sun and warm temperatures. I want to start off with the aquifer and pollen this morning. We just got the pollen count in fresh, hot off the uh, presses. Uh, the aquifer, after going up for a couple of days, is now going back down. It's down a tenth of a foot to 648.3, so we're still in stage two. There's the pollen count. Molds. They did come down from where they were yesterday. And it was a huge number yesterday. We're at 2,340 today. Oaks at 620 moved up just a hair. It's in the high category. Pecan and grass are both low. So it's still molds and oak that are bugging all of us. Uh, as we look at temperatures, uh, we're sitting at 71 degrees at the airport right now. Cloudy skies, mostly cloudy skies. 67 Kerrville, 71 in Hondo, 73 in New Braunfels. Most everyone's going to be in the 70s here soon, but you're still seeing a few 60s if you're up there in the higher elevation. 68 Comfort, 67 right now in Kerrville. Forecast for today, we'll start to see some breaks in those clouds as we head towards the lunch hour and then partly cloudy skies this afternoon. We're up to 86 for a high. Gusty winds out of the south anywhere from 10 to 20 miles per hour. 
Some even warmer temperatures tomorrow and over the weekend, but perhaps a little bit of relief in the form of some thunderstorms Saturday evening. We look at that forecast coming up in just a few minutes, guys. Thank you, Justin. A quick look at the roads with Trans Guide. Looking out at Loop 1604, Kitty Hawk, and also Highway 90 at Loop 410. Things are moving in these shots. Now we don't see any accidents on cameras around town. In your morning headlines, incredible video of a teenager trying to escape from police and a woman tries to steal a cop car. Plus, how would you like to work for a company, find out you have been overpaid, then ordered to pay back thousands of dollars? It actually happened, and if you live on a golf course, would you expect your house to get hit by a golf ball? Now and then, of course, but this, what happened to this family, it's absolutely yes. insane. Really good questions, Stephanie. Mm -hmm. Great questions. We've got answers. I'm glad. Coming up in just a second. But first, we're going to start with this. This could be a little disturbing. Watch right here on your screen. That's a car being chased by police, and watch what happens. That was a teenager jumping out of that moving car during that police chase. Looked like the teenagers nailed that guardrail pretty hard. This happening in Columbus, Ohio. That teenager jumped out of the car the police were chasing because it was allegedly stolen. Here's the part that makes you go, huh? The teen was wearing a neck brace because he had been in a previous accident in a stolen car. The accident happened the day before this one. Police caught and arrested a 16-year-old driver and a 15-year-old in an alleged stolen car from the first accident. All right, let's take it to Tennessee. That is 27-year-old Jennifer Cunningham. She's in jail in Tennessee facing 20 different charges. What did she do? It all started when a deputy tried to pull her over from broken taillight. She wouldn't stop. There was a short pursuit. She took out a mailbox and her own tire trying to flee. She was caught. She was arrested for DWI, among other charges. Officers handcuffed her, put her in the back of the patrol car. And here's where it gets interesting. According to police, she was able to get her arms from behind her back to her front Still handcuffed, she slipped through the gap in the petition between the front and back seats, and then she tried to take off with the police car. This is where they figured it all out and figured out what she was trying to do. She's in the front. Oh my God. Get her! Get her! Get her! My first reaction is how did she fit through the partition so easily? I mean, that window is pretty small, and uh, but she is a smaller female and was able to to scoot through. Yeah, she was able to pull away, but then she ended up hitting another police cruiser and that was the end of that. One of the charges she could face driving a patrol car. She has a hundred and sixty six thousand dollar bond while she sits in jail. I right, take it to Alabama. Several school employees got pretty shocking letters from the Board of Education in Chilton County. The letters told the employees they had been overpaid for several years and they had to pay the money back. We're talking thousands of dollars. Christy Payne is one of the workers. She is a lunchroom manager. Her letter said she was overpaid $23,000 over the last six years and had to pay it all back. When she was promoted several years ago, she ended up getting paid a salary meant for someone with more experience. Six years later, she was given three options. Pay it all in a lump sum, pay $4,000 in yearly payment for several years, or they could start taking $325 out of her check every month. The letter also said they could add more money if she didn't take care of the situation. Fortunately, there are labor and employment attorneys. They acted like I did it. I work in the lunchroom. I only know about food and lunchroom duties. I don't know anything about the payroll department. You can run into problems with federal wage law for taking away money that's been paid to them. The longer it's been paid, the more likely it is these employees are going to have a stronger argument that they're entitled to keep the money. Yeah, by the way, one of the other letters went to a teacher who was recently promoted. She was told to repay nearly $33,000. The school board was supposed to have a meeting earlier this week, but it was canceled. They didn't tell anybody why. All right, if you're a golfer or live near a golf course, this is one of those age old arguments. If you live on that course and get hit by a golf ball, who's responsible? You live on a golf course, but the golfer hit a bad shot. All right, this is a house in Massachusetts on a golf course near a landing area, and it apparently gets nailed by golf balls on a regular basis. There's a lot of bad golfers. The owners knew they were buying a house on a golf course. They have been there since 2017 and love the golf course view but not the hazards that come with it. So they got a lawyer. The club says there is potential for damage when you live on a golf course. 
but they have insurance to pay for the damage. But the Tinzar family refused that payment. They want the golf balls to quit hitting their house. The judge awarded them $100,000 and then $3.5 million in emotional distress. Fees and interest bring the total to nearly $5 million. The golf course is going to appeal, of course, and they changed the hole around so the house doesn't get hit so much. What they should do is put up a big net right that, there by That's the what I was thinking, yeah. Top Golf style. And then yeah. the house, the owners of the house will be all upset because now they're blocking their golf course view. Oh, right, that's the other, that's, that's the catch so, right there. Who, yeah. Whether but, it's them or a future owner of that property, they would hate the net being there. I always, and, I, and I guess I'm wrong in a lot of places, but I always contended because I play golf, mm -hmm. that if you live on a golf course and you live where a ball could land if you hit a hook or a slice or something, mm -hmm. You chose to live there. Yeah. The golf course was there before you were there. What if, but what if it happens like overruled. six or seven hundred times a year? Mm, that's a lot. Uh, well, David says okay. a lot of oh, bad I didn't golfers. Give some lessons. <laughs> right. Bad Jesus. golfers. Huh? Enjoy the view <laughs> and four. Thank you, David. <laughs> 908, about 71 degrees. Still ahead on GMSA at nine. We're going to explain how the city is planning on using part of the bond to improving housing if it is approved by San Antonio voters. And with chances of a major recession increasing, according to some economists, what could that mean for you and your family? We'll explain after the break. Welcome back. A report out today will give insight into how the U.S. economy is really doing. It will show the gross domestic product for the first quarter of this year. As CNN and Amy Kiley report, some economists are warning about the increasing chances of a major recession and what that could mean for you. Today, the government is reporting the U.S. gross domestic product for the first quarter of this year. It shows how the economy did from January through March. The White House suggests going back another three months to get a broader picture. When taken together, growth over the two quarters is expected to be at a solid pace. Those numbers may be from the past, but economists say they could tell something about the future. If you look at a lot of other forecasters, they are also saying the, the uh, risk of recession has been rising in recent months. Declaring a recession is complicated, but one big indicator is two consecutive quarters of inflation-adjusted GDP decline. Deutsche Bank just announced it's predicting a major recession. It points to the Federal Reserve wanting to bring down rising prices by raising interest rates. Basically, it was always going to be difficult for the Fed to get things just right, to raise interest rates just enough to tamp down demand and, and get inflation under control, but not too much so that it tipped us into recession. Another factor is supply chain issues, from Russia's war in Ukraine to the pandemic and China's recent response to COVID-19. A lot of people right now still haven't been able to find a logic behind putting thousands, hundreds of people into these fan tanks, into these makeshift hospitals. And uh, we don't yet see the end of lockdown here in Shanghai. A recession could affect Americans by causing unemployment and a lower standard of living. I'm Amy Kiley reporting. The National Bureau of Economic Research is the group that officially declares the U.S. in a recession. It does so retroactively after it reviews economic data from a given time period. So I remember a number of times over my adult life where they've said, oh yeah, by the way, we're already in a recession. In a recession. Yes, of yes. course. We'll keep you posted. Well, 914 right now. I know, Justin, uh, looking at the drought monitor, even though we had rain. It's very colorful. <laughs> yes. um, yeah, the drought monitor is in as promised, and we don't like to see all the colors on there. That means the drought is still there. Here's the bit of good news. We did see some improvement in the state. Last week, 87% of the state of Texas was in drought. This week, 82%. The problem is it's not really our area that saw the huge improvements. We Yes, we did get some rain, and it helped a little bit, but we've still got exceptional drought stretching from Pearsall down to Dilly, Catula, and over to Creso Springs. And a new area popping up here across parts of the hill country, Lakey, Uvalde, or close to Uvalde. That's where exceptional drought is really kicking in. Of course, a lot of farmland out here, and that's not what we want to see. Extreme drought continues to work its way across Bear County, too. So we're, we're seeing that increase. We need more rain. I feel like we say that every week, but there it is again. Uh, Medina Lake is at 19% full. It's down 55 feet and it's down 7.3 feet over the last three months. Of course, it is pumping season two for the reservoir there. Rainfall so far this year at the airport, 3.59. We're still about four and a half inches below average. Uh, again, we did see some rainfall. It just really wasn't enough. Del Rio is at 
about three inches below average there. There's the scene outside. We've got cloudy skies over a few peaks of blue sky earlier, as we pointed out, but it looks like things have clouded up again. Uh, 71 degrees right now, 66 to the dew point. That number has been steadily rising through the morning with south southeasterly winds at about 14 miles per hour in gusty. The satellite picture reveals that we do have quite a bit of cloud cover stretching from San Antonio and especially as you get up into the hill country, but breaks already starting to show up there uh, to the south and east of town. And I think probably south and east of San Antonio will see the sun earliest, but then the uh, skies will eventually clear here across San Antonio as well. Uh, temperatures 71 degrees is quite a bit warmer this morning because we do have the humidity in place. And then once the sun comes out, you'll see uh, much warmer temperatures this afternoon, probably into the mid 80s. We're already up to 78 in Divine, 71 Hondo, 67 underneath some cloudy skies in Bandera, and 69 right now in Comfort. Dew points, they've risen into the 60s, and they're going to stay right there, if not rise a little bit more. Really, throughout the entire forecast, there's no indication that the humidity is going away anytime soon. So that's something we're just going to have to deal with this, at this point. And it's going to create those cloudy mornings and then partly cloudy afternoons, just like today. By midday, 77 degrees here in San Antonio. And then by this afternoon, we're in the mid 80s, 86. Uh, gusty winds, too. That southerly breeze will gust to 20, 25 at times today. And uh, that will probably be the case tomorrow. Here's the big picture. And the moisture is surging in across all of Texas and far enough west where there will be some isolated severe storms out across west Texas today. Not here. That's along the dry line. And that dry line stays to our west for the most part. So it's just warm here today and tomorrow. We will start off with some drizzle again tomorrow and then hot and windy Friday afternoon. Things change a little bit on Saturday, though. This frontal boundary, it's weak frontal boundary, sinks south. Probably washes out at some point, but if it can make it to the hill country, that may be just uh, close enough to touch off a few storms. And some of those storms could work their way towards San Antonio. Right now, just a 20% chance. I, I think uh, there's an opportunity there, but the chances really are pretty low. A lot of things have to come together. If we do see some storms, though, they could be strong to severe, and that's why we have to point it out. 89 tomorrow, 90 on Saturday with just that 20% chance of rain. Late Sunday night, we'll watch some storms out west. Some of those could work their way towards San Antonio late Sunday night into early Monday. 88 degrees, 91 Tuesday, and another small chance for rain Wednesday with a high of 91. Guys. All right. Thank you, Justin. Now to a scam alert for Randolph Brooks Federal Credit Union customers. The bank warning people against responding to a certain text message. The message looks like this and claims to be from Randolph Brooks. It then has instructions to reply, but the credit union says you should not respond in any way. If you did, the credit union advises not to give out any personal information over the phone. Fraudsters can spoof the number to make it appear to be from the credit union legitimately. Remember, if you're not sure the call's coming from your institution, hang up and call the number on their website. And time now, 919 and 71 degrees for now. Up next on GMSA at 9, how city leaders are proposing to handle concerns about crime on the south and southeast side. Welcome back. Fighting crime in District 3. That was the focus of last night's town hall meeting with Councilwoman Phyllis Villagran and San Antonio Police Chief William McManus. That area covers most of the south side and southeast side of the city. And the goal for that area is to refine public safety standards. As John Paul Brajas explains, residents in that area are concerned about the frequency of shootings. Street racing, the drug use, the prostitutes, the homeless people. Those just some of the problems brought up at the District 3 public safety meeting. Mental health and increased shootings were also high priorities for those in attendance. Police Chief William McManus attributes that to risky behavior. People looking at each other and they don't like the way they're doing that. And arguments and disputes over whatever it may be, whether it's drugs or alcohol or the last piece of brisket at barbecue, people are shooting each other over that. And, and it, it's, it's not slowing down. This doorbell video shows a victim asking for help after being shot three times. The shooting less than 24 hours ago on Anza Street near Pecan. During the meeting, people's emotions reflected their pain and worry. The night my mom passed she witnessed that she experienced 40 Recalling shootings they and their families heard. It's just like birds chirping 
it's common to have shots going off. It has gotten worse. We used to have a lot of pride in taking care of our neighborhood. Some solutions the chief mentioned were micro hotspots targeting high crime areas, a UTSA study on violent crime that he hopes to be done at the end of the summer, and a police substation up for a vote on the May 7th ballot. Seem like I'm looking for immediate change now. John Paul Barajas, KSAP 12 News. San Antonio's biggest bond ever is already in front of city voters. The $1.2 billion bond program includes the usual things like repairing streets, building fire stations, and improving local parks. However, it also includes something new, housing. Case out City Hall reporter Garrett Berger tells us how the uh, $150 million would be used. Unlike most of the bond program, there is no definitive project list for the $150 million in the housing bond. Instead, the money would be split into five areas based on a framework that a citizen committee developed and city council approved. Most of the money would go toward preserving, acquiring, or producing affordable housing in a mixture of rentals and owned homes. But it also includes a chunk for housing with supportive services. The 25 million for supportive housing is targeting people fleeing domestic violence, aging out of foster care, and helping to move people off of the street and out of the shelters. Katie Vela was co-chair for the housing bond committee and is also executive director of the South Alamo Regional Alliance for the Homeless. We need units available to help move people off of the street, even if they have support from our partners. The NRP group, a developer typically focused on apartment complexes, also supports the housing bond, which one of its execs says would make it easier to include more units reserved for some of the lowest income renters when building new developments. The bonds certainly come in, especially when you want to target more than just like five to 10 percent. Some have their reservations on the housing bond. Our infrastructure to the tune of $6.6 .6 billion is where we need to be focusing on. And I'm, I just got concerns about getting into the housing business with our tax dollars. Now it's voters' turn to decide. The bond program shows up as six different propositions on San Antonio voters' ballots. The housing bond portion is Proposition F. Early voting lasts through May 3rd, and then there's Election Day on Saturday, May 7th. I'm Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. And you can find a list of polling locations and what time they're open on our website at KSAT.com. Just click on the Vote 2022 section that's under the news tab. There's a whole lot more coming up on GMSA at 9. Including a preview of the NFL draft, which begins tonight. David Sears will be with us again to talk about Cowboys and Texans and what they're looking for. Plus, after Elon Musk reached a deal to buy Twitter, what could happen next? We'll explain who the real winner in this deal really is when we come back. San Antonio police putting out an appeal for information about a shooting that left two people dead and one person in a local hospital. Right now, they're trying to find out who shot them and why. All three victims were sitting in their car at the time in a parking lot off of Fredericksburg Road, not far from Medical Drive. Trina Weber has more from the scene and tells us investigators are at a loss when it comes to clues. Based on what police had to say late last night, this was a crime that had no witnesses that they know of so far. And they're hoping that anyone who knows or saw what happened will come forward. Officers who responded to the 911 call shortly before 10 last night found the man and two women still inside their car. In our video, you can see the bullet holes in the windshield. The medical examiner's office confirmed this morning that the man and one of the women are the ones who were killed. The other woman was in critical condition as she was rushed to a hospital. The parking lot where this happened just before 10 last night is between Highlanders Bar and an apartment complex on Fredericksburg Road. The police were not sure if the victims had been inside the bar at some point or if they were here for some other reason. Well, the medical examiner's office is still working to identify the man and woman who were killed. And again, police say that they are looking for answers, some kind of information about what happened, and they urge anyone who knows to please give them a call. Reporting from the Northwest Side, Katrina Weber, KSAT 12 News. Okay, now to a health story about kids and what parents need to know. The CDC and World Health Organization have sent out recent alerts about a new investigation into severe hepatitis in children. Outbreaks around the globe have resulted in one death and at least 17 liver transplants. Courtney Friedman found if children here in San Antonio have been affected and what parents and caregivers can do to prevent that spread. A startling alert for parents worldwide. Unusual clusters of children with severe hepatitis or inflammation of the liver. We see hepatitis 
um, all, all the time throughout the year, and they're mostly sporadic cases here and there. The largest outbreak has been reported in the UK, but cases have also been reported in Spain, Israel, the United States, Denmark, Ireland, the Netherlands, Italy, Norway, France, Romania, and Belgium. In the outbreak that occurred in the UK, about three-fourths of them were an adenovirus. Dr. Tess Barton is an infectious disease pediatrician with University Health and UT Health San Antonio and says adenoviruses are very common and come in many strains. Doctors investigating believe an adenovirus strain is to blame for the hepatitis outbreaks, but they haven't been able to confirm that for sure. The UK data suggests it has nothing to do with COVID or vaccines. Very few of those children of the 100 and so or so children had actually received any kind of COVID vaccination. Fewer than 20% of them tested positive for COVID. Dr. Barton says San Antonio's recent hepatitis cases normally would not have seemed unusual. Definitely we'll be going and looking back and seeing if it appears to be any kind of clustering going on and if we've had any increase in particular viruses such as adenovirus. In the meantime, they're asking pediatricians to be extra vigilant. Cases of uh, vomiting, diarrhea, jaundice, um, all the other symptoms that we would see with liver failure or, or poor liver function. Parents and caregivers urged to wash hands before and after preparing food or changing diapers. Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News. By the way, Dr. Barton said uh, kids should also get the available hepatitis A and B vaccines. Just talk to your pediatrician. In other health news, new developments in the pandemic here at home. Metro Health says our risk level is getting worse. It's been in the low category for a while. However, as of last night, it was in the mild category, and that's because cases are slowly rising. Yeah, yesterday, 115 new cases reported. In the past seven days, we've seen about 116 per day. No new deaths have been reported. 52 COVID patients are in San Antonio hospitals, 12 of them in ICU. Nine are currently at last check on ventilators. And taking a look outside with a live cam, yeah, slowly warming up, but I guess we could still survive the heat with that cloud cover, right? For now. For now. <laughs> for now. Uh, yeah, the clouds will go away, uh, and we'll see some warmer temperatures this afternoon. On a positive note, let's take a look at this uh, shot on our KSAC Connect. Beautiful shot coming out of the hill country. You'll love that. Look at the, the rays of, of the sun there coming through the clouds. Beautiful, beautiful shot. We appreciate the KSAC Connect pictures as always. And here's what's ahead for us. Uh, we're going to deal with the morning clouds, but the sun pops out not only today, but tomorrow. T tomorrow is going to be pretty much a carbon copy of today, other than it will be a little bit warmer. As we head into Saturday, hot, windy, some isolated storms late, and then on Sunday, more heat and humidity. And really, that's kind of the theme going forward here throughout the entire forecast. 71 Uvalde, it's 71 in San Antonio right now, 73 in New Braunfels, still a few places reporting temperatures in the 60s. 68 right now in Bolverde with cloudy skies. Here's our forecast. Uh, clouds will slowly scatter out, 77 by midday. We'll take it up to 86 for a high temperature today. A few places could be getting close to 90, and I do think we'll see some 90s on the map as we head into the weekend. We'll have more on that weekend forecast and a look at the coast, coastal forecast coming up in just a bit, guys. Thank you, Justin. And one of the most influential social networks is said to have a new owner. It's been all the talk this week. We told you about, of course, billionaire investor Elon Musk, who owns Tesla, SpaceX, reaching a deal to buy Twitter. But what, if anything, would change with Twitter and us other social media platforms after this takeover? And who is the real winner in all of this? CNN's Jen Sullivan takes a closer look. The world's richest man will soon be in charge of Twitter. Elon Musk has reached a deal to buy the company for $44 billion. I think Musk is playing a pretty hefty price for Twitter, and I think it's a head scratcher to many. The deal is raising widespread questions and concerns from Twitter users to lawmakers on Capitol Hill, all wondering what this takeover will mean for the platform and for society. Twitter has been a dark, dark place. I hope it doesn't get any darker. We're all watching it with a great deal of interest. Experts say several changes may be ahead, saying Musk is likely to move to modernize and monetize Twitter. It's probably turning into a subscription platform, uh, two, three dollars a month, 
they'll lose significant amount of users, but probably those that would stay on now would significantly increase revenue. Experts say one thing is very clear. Morgan Stanley could be the biggest winner. The investment bank Musk chose to carry out the deal, expected to profit as much as $1.3 billion from financing Musk's loan. And what does this mean for the future of social media? Experts say Musk has condemned Twitter's approach to content moderation censorship, but it's unclear how exactly he will approach freedom of speech on the platform. But does that mean that there's less constriction in terms of things that could be said on Twitter? But that that's a tight wire app. Meanwhile, the move has Tesla and SpaceX investors rattled, just as governmental regulators zero in on the Twitter deal. This is going to get a lot of scrutiny. Not ideal for Tesla and SpaceX investors. <laughs> For today's Consumer Watch, I'm Jen Sullivan. And on Tuesday, Tesla shares went down 12% as investors reacted to Musk's deal with to buy Twitter. Twitter's chief executive says it will likely take three to six months for the deal to close. Pro Football Government, powered by Davis Law Firm. And the biggest night for the NFL outside of the Super Bowl is draft night. Cowboys and Texans looking for a lot of help in this year's draft, which begins tonight at 7 right here on KSAT. David Sears is back to break things all down. Mr. Sears, good morning. Welcome back. Good morning. I think the Texans are probably looking to do more in this draft because the last couple of drafts they've really not had very many picks. Well, and the first couple Coach O'Brien gave away so many yeah, picks, so they're so, just now kind of playing catch-up. So they've, they've got uh, nine picks in this year's draft. Yep. Cowboys wow. have... No, they have 10, Cowboys have nine. Okay. Let's start with a, uh, with a look at the Cowboys pick. So in the first round, they don't pick till 24th. So hopefully you're gonna go home and take a nap tonight. Because <laughs> <laughs> the 24th <laughs> pick is gonna be, oh, I don't know, 9.30, it's supposed to be on the seven. And then it goes to like 10.30, so I don't wow. know, I'm just guessing around and that. First on the clock tonight, of course, is Jacksonville, yeah, followed by so, Detroit and Houston. Yeah, so. But uh, the Cowboys got the first pick. This is the 24th pick. They've got the, in the second round, 56. They've got a third rounder. They've got a fourth rounder. And look how many picks oh they got goodness. in the fifth round. I don't wow. know why they collected fifth round picks. One, two, three, four fifth round picks. And then they've got a sixth round pick and a seventh round pick. Here's the interesting thing. Yes, sir. They may be using their last pick for a kicker, which is very unusual. Usually you just invite free agents to come to camp and sure. pick, huh. a, pick a kicker. But they may have to actually pick a kicker in the draft. And mm. they were talking about the kid from Texas, UT, okay. be, being their kicker. So hmm. the first pick, yesterday they were having these discussions about maybe they might try to move up in the draft. There's not really a player that stands out. There's, there's a bunch of really good football players in this draft, but there's not one or two that just, you know, jump off the page no. at you and say, oh, we got to have that guy and we got to get him with the first pick. Jacksonville is expected to take a defensive player out of Georgia but then they might take the kid out of Michigan who's a defensive player. Yeah, Aiden so, Hutchinson, you know, defensive yeah. end. Yeah, so he's... It's, it's, it's kind of a weird situation. But So the Cowboys lost Amari Cooper. Yeah. So I was watching a mock draft yesterday, and they had the Cowboys picking a wide receiver. It's like, where, where did that come from? Cowboys need an offensive lineman, yeah. and they need some defensive linemen. So and they could move up even from weird. the 24 pick in yeah, the Yeah, that's what round. they were talking about yesterday was mm -hmm. they might trade up and try to get, try mm -hmm. to get something else. So let's look at the, uh, the Oilers draft tonight. The, the Oilers, Oilers have a lot of picks. So Oilers too? Oilers? Texans. You did. You did. Oh, I thought you were joking. <laughs> Old school. The Texans. So they got the third pick, and they've got the 13th pick in the first round. Remember, they traded away Deshaun Watson. To, stop, stop, Justin. They traded away Deshaun Watson to Cleveland and got yep. Cleveland's first round pick. So they get the third and the 13th pick. One quarter of the teams in the NFL have two picks in the first round. So think about that. Mm -hmm. A quarter of all the teams in the NFL have two picks in the first round. Yeah. So there's a list of all the uh, all the Texas picks. They've got five picks in the first 80. That's a lot of picks. They mm -hmm. it'd be kind of hard to mess this up. Right. Well, I mean, they still could. They're Houston. Um, oh, I wonder if they'll go get a quarterback. Um, that's that's the thing. Like this Malik Willis out of like, Liberty. You know, I think they need more more than the quarterback. They need to find out if they got a really good quarterback in Davis because he, he spent a lot of time on his back last year yep. because he got sacked so many times, like 30 times or something. Lovey Smith is the new is the new head coach. So we'll see what uh, what he can pull out of the hat this year to see if they can get. I mean, you know, give the kid a chance. He didn't have any chance last year. So sure. they need offensive okay. linemen. They need defensive linemen. They need receivers. Receivers and running backs, and it looks like they're going to go with the offensive lineman first and with their third pick, and then the 13th pick, they may go defensive lineman, but that, that's according to mock drafts. Things always change in the draft. Well, I mean, of course. These guys, all these pundits can sit around and tell you this is, they're taking this person, this team's taking that person. Next thing you know, it's like, 
but nobody again, you even thought of is going into. But again, the, the season, major though. takeaway is nobody particularly elite this year. No, not really. Okay. I don't. I don't think at any position. At, at any position, there's yeah. not there's not elite quarterback. Usually, there's like one or two or three sure. quarterbacks. Sure. Yeah. This uh, yeah. Uh, this Malik Willis may not go yeah. till uh, so, twenty to thirtieth so. pick tonight. And and Leal kid from Judson, yeah. in San Antonio. Oh, yeah. He he was projected first. Now they're talking about he may not go to the second, maybe not even to the third round. Yeah. And he, the Cowboys were interested in him, so they yeah. may he may fall down to twenty four. And he's out of A and M, right? So, yeah, yeah, he's out of A and M. Is out of Justin. Justin. So Justin's now the cool. guy that really showed up this year is Justin Horn because he took that Wonderlick test that all the all the players take, <laughs> and he like scored really high on that. It yeah. was it was a sample test, so I don't know if it's super oh. accurate. Okay, okay. Well, don't you get like a thirty or something? Yeah, so you can be like some really smart high. guy. No, no. Wow. <laughs> no. no pressure. I'm pretty sure like Fitzgerald, the quarterback that went to Harvard, he scored like a 50 or something. So like oh. give us a real quick sample question from Wonderlick. I Well, it's like SAT, like stuff that's like uh, percentages. If okay. you spend this much on dinner and there's yeah. a tip, like you got to do the math. Okay. Wow. Gotcha. At least that's what I saw online. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> Justin's Wonderlook score tomorrow on GMS A9. Okay, <laughs> gay set 12 tonight. 7 o'clock is the first round of the NFL draft. Second and third tomorrow. Four through seven, seven. All into the weekend. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I don't okay. make a big, big deal out of it. This Quick question. Yep. Did you see uh, producer Prashada's jacket today? Uh-uh. It was Houston Oilers. I was like, I didn't know. That's where I got it from. All together now. Wow. Houston <laughs> Oilers. Houston. Okay, 943, 72 <laughs> degrees. Oh, You're watching GMSA. We'll be right back. Good luck, Houston. Oilers. We're knocked on the, the door. Draft. Next year, we're going to kick the in. 946. Welcome back. And earlier we saw a little graphic that Justin had behind him, but I like the, you know, on the bottom, it's like not current. Not current. Not current. <laughs> That's, yeah, I mean, because the, 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 we- the old weather guy, me, that signature scares me, that, that image right there. We saw this on radar. We would be, mm-hmm. yes, we would be a little nervous right now. And so, yeah, if you, you're watching GMSA without the sound on, I want to make sure you know uh, this is not current. This is from last year. Exactly one year ago, we had that. A uh, big storm down there around Hondo and had a big hook on it. Did drop a tornado, but what was significant about this storm is it dropped that hailstone, if you remember, the largest now in Texas history, 6.4 inches in diameter. It's huge. Uh, the weight was 1.26 pounds. It still holds a record. We had a big hailstone earlier this year, if you remember, up I-35 in Salado. It got close, but it did not beat this hailstone, so this remains the record. Uh, folks in Hondo remember this storm very, very well. That was exactly one year ago, and it goes to show you that this is a time of year where we certainly can see severe weather. This is kind of the hardest severe weather season for us, and we do have some more chances for storms coming up. Now, they're low chances, but Saturday, for instance, really more so Saturday evening, Saturday night, we could see a few severe storms, so that's something we have to, to keep tabs on, and we'll certainly keep you posted. As we look at the time lapse, here over the last uh, several hours or so, we've had clouds really rolling in here. Still cloudy at the airport, 71 degrees. South Southeast Julie winds at 14. Dew points are very high in the 60s. And I'll point out that we are starting to see some breaks here across Wilson County. If you're watching us from Floresville, sun's starting to pop out there, but still cloudy for much of Bear County. We've got some high clouds coming over top of us too. But even looking at some of the trans guide cameras, I'm starting to see the sun pop out in a few places. And by lunchtime, we should see quite a bit more sun. 70 degrees right now in Holota, 69 Boulevard, 73 New Braunfels. A little bit of sun for you in Seguin, 71 degrees there. And the other big story today will be the gusty winds. Winds out of the south gusty anywhere from 20 to 25 miles per hour. And this particular model shows even stronger wind gusts as we get into tonight. This is around 10 o'clock. Seeing some gusts potentially all the way up to 30 miles per hour. Dew points have increased. We're now starting to see dew points in the 70s. We went from the pleasant category yesterday up to almost depressive. And you're going to feel that humidity if you're going to be out and about today. And uh, honestly, as we get into the weekend, this humidity sticks around. So then we have to start talking about heat index values. That that will be an issue uh, once we get temperatures into the 90s and you got dew points in the 60s, it's going to feel a little bit warmer. But that moisture continues to move into all of Texas. And here's our case at 12 hour forecast, 77 noontime, mostly cloudy by 4 p.m. Partly cloudy in 86. There are those gusty winds this evening. Temperatures staying in the 80s, perhaps falling into the 70s by 9 p.m. with mostly clear skies at that point. Here's our future cast warm today. Dry line out west. There could be a few storms along that, but they stay well to our west morning drizzle tomorrow and then same story hot and windy 
Then we start to watch this frontal boundary. It sinks south. It's probably going to wash out as it gets a little bit closer to us. But if it can make it to the hill country, that may be just close enough to get some storms going and some of those storms could move down towards the San Antonio area. It's not a great chance, 20%. But as I said, if we do get some storms, there's potential for a couple strong ones in there. So we do need to mention it. If you're right now to the coast this weekend, looks good. Temperatures in the mid 80s. Winds will be a little breezy to 10 to 20 miles per hour, and that's going to kick waves up uh, anywhere from three to five feet. Uh, the water temperatures anywhere from 75 to 79, so it's, it's pretty good beach weather if you're heading down to the south and east of San Antonio this weekend. 89 Friday, 90 on Saturday with that chance of evening storms, 89 Sunday. Another small chance of storms making your way towards San Antonio late Sunday night early on Monday. We'll be right back. Younger children here in the United States may soon be able to get protection from COVID-19. Today, Moderna announced it is seeking emergency use authorization from the FDA for its vaccine to be given from children uh, from six months to five years old. Moderna officials say the vaccines are safe and common reactions were minimal, including pain at the injection site. The FDA says it will inspect Moderna's submission and will meet with an advisory committee to discuss the issue. The pandemic may have affected workplace creativity. That's according to research just released in the scientific journal Nature. The study's author says employees on virtual meeting programs like Zoom have a little more difficulty coming up with innovative ideas than those who talk in person. However, researchers did admit there are a few caveats to the study. They say the process of coming up with ideas appeared to have happened easier in person, but the difference in making critical decisions on those ideas was minimal. Chipotle is thanking healthcare heroes in a big way. They are giving 2,000 of them free burritos, bowls, or whatever else they like for a year. Wow. That's more than a million dollars in free food. If you know a hero in healthcare, you can post on Chipotle's social media and tag your hero. Share a little about what they've done for you and how they've impacted your life. However, listen up, you only have until May 6th. That is National Nurses Day. Then Chipotle will randomly select 2,000 people for free free Chipotle for a year, a tasty way to thank the people who spend their lives taking care of others. And we just jumped up to 73 degrees. Uh, we're starting to see a few peaks of sun. We'll see more and more of that as we get later into today. 86 your high temperature, 89 Friday, and then uh, close to 90 over the weekend. Small chance storms there Saturday evening with some gusty winds over the weekend too. Right. Okay. Small chance, but not the big the big rain that we had earlier in the week. Right. Uh, it's small chance, but we have to point it out because if we do see some storms, they could be strong to severe. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Don't forget NFL draft tonight. Uh, Houston has the number three pick. The Dallas Cowboys have the number 24 pick. That could all change, but we do have a bit of a programming note for you because all that's going to happen live here on KSAT. That's right. Uh, so it starts at 7. That's round one, but night beat will be pushed till 1030. Usually it starts at 10, so just be prepared for that. That's right. So coverage uh, ESPN uh, on ABC coming up tonight starting at 7 o'clock. Good luck to both teams. Yes. Yeah. And then it's the, the Houston, Houston Texans. <laughs> Houston Texans. <laughs> Have a great day, guys.